Hello and welcome to WFYI Presents Heartland Film. I'm your host, Eric Hartvig, with co-host Iggy, the official spokes gnome of Indie Shorts. Hello there! In this edition, we'll be exploring strength. Now, we all know a little bit more about what it takes to overcome obstacles after the year we've had. But extraordinary strength is demonstrated through the characters coming up in these two short films. If you haven't heard of A.J. Andrews, you might just have a new sports hero to add to your list. She's the first woman to be awarded the Rawlings Gold Glove, an award given for outstanding fielders in professional baseball. Knocking Down the Fences tells the story of A.J.'s career, her ambition, her unbelievable work ethic, and all the additional barriers she faces as a woman trying to make it as a professional athlete. And then there's little Marley McDonald, the mutton bustin' champion. What is mutton bustin', you ask? It's a sheep rodeo for buckaroos 55 pounds or less. Marley was born with an aggressive brain tumor and is now in long-term survival care. Through it all, she remains fearless with plans to become a spy. Later, we'll catch up with some of the filmmakers behind these Heartland shorts, and we'll hear from Heartland's own Courtney Essen about the upcoming Indie Shorts International Film Festival. But first, let's sit back, relax, and watch AJ Andrews knock down some things. Every time I step on the field, I feel like it's my domain. I feel like it's my territory. And it's almost like my hunting ground. Then if you dare come near my hunting grounds, your stuff is going to get eaten up. Turner got a hold of the first pitch he saw, and AJ Andrews just laid out like Wonder Woman to get the play. What a play by Andrews. You hit a ball in the outfield, and if it's anywhere in my vicinity, I'm going to make sure it ends up in my glove. My name is AJ Andrews. I am a professional softball player, and I'm the first woman to ever win a Rollins Skull Glove. If you ever heard anybody say no excuses, this is why. It's always reasons, always ways to get things done without help. Ugh. If you want, you want to work hard enough. My favorite first initial meeting of AJ is um, her first practice. She was late. I think she, I don't know, had to pass a physical or do something. It held her up. And so she was out here by herself, and it was just the coaching staff and her. First ball I ever hit AJ went over her head, and she dove head first into the fence. And I thought we killed her on her first ball. But that really just told me so much about who she was. I mean, she's just fearless. She just attacks anything. And from the first ball I ever hit her, I knew we had a special player. Did she catch it? I don't think she did. <laughs> the game that I remember the most with the best diving catch I can remember AJ making. I know I have one too. <laughs> is when she was playing for the Akron Racers. So it was my freshman year during um, Super regionals, and a ball was hit on the right field line. There was a ball hit in between left and center. Nobody thought it was going to be caught. And we both called for it at the same time. And AJ came out of nowhere, literally looked like she was flying, and catches the ball. And we ran straight into each other, and I fell. And I just remember like looking up, kind of like looking for AJ. And she just kind of picked me up, and she was like, I got it. <laughs> and she caught it. <laughs> I think that was that catch is probably what really, really got her to the Golden Glove, because that was just ridiculous. The Wrong School Glove is an award that is given to, typically given to Major League Baseball players for being the best defender. 
So for 59 years, it had only been given to Major League Baseball players up until 2016. And that was the first year that it was given to a woman. It was really exciting just because I was now a pioneer for breaking barriers in this sport and for breaking barriers in women's sports in general. I, I drove five hours to see her get it because I wanted to be there right at the time she was about to be given it because I wanted to be there for such a historic moment. I think they nominated a softball player because of AJ. I think that her achievements and the way she goes all out for a ball in the outfield, like, I think that to try and ignore her any longer would just be ridiculous. The way I got recruited was because I made a diving catch in the outfield as an LSU recruiter was walking by. If I had not dove for that one ball, my entire life could be completely different. And that just comes down to effort. While it is an honor to be able to be a professional athlete and to be one of the very few that get to play professional softball, it is, it's hard to do. It's hard to get to be a professional athlete as a woman. And then it's even harder to stay one just because you don't have the means. I mean, you're playing a professional sport, you would think that that comes with being paid professionally and not having to work extra jobs because you're a professional athlete. but. That's not the case for softball, and it's not the case for a lot of female sports. To be honest, being a professional softball player, you have to, I mean, not saying people do, but you're eligible to qualify for food stamps. Like, that's how little we get paid. My days get pretty busy. I kind of start off early mornings. I'll get up and try to go work out. After I work out for probably about an hour, I'll go to yoga. Then I will go either to the field to take balls off the machine, take some outfield work off the machine, or I will go to rehab. After rehab, I go on campus for school. From there, go to give lessons just because I need extra money. Lord. Give me some. Yeah, girl. After doing lessons, I will go back to the gym, typically. I think AJ's story really dispels the myth of meritocracy in the United States. AJ Andrews. She's a professional athlete. She should be compensated as such. She should be able to have that as her one job. And unfortunately, AJ's story is like many women athletes, particularly black women athletes. Me personally, I'm still in school. Like I'm getting my master's degree just because I know that softball isn't going to take me to the levels or pay me the amount of money that I need to make a living. So I have to put myself in the position to set myself up for success outside of softball, which is sad because no man has to say that. My boyfriend is a baseball player and He's set, right? He gets drafted and he gets a guaranteed amount of money, then even maybe a bonus to go play the sport that he loves. And once he gets to the professional level, the top level in the MLB, then he will get even more money. And so 
I am so proud of him and everything that he has achieved. And I believe that he deserves everything that comes his way. But then so do I. There's this idea that women's sports don't sell, and so there's this kind of business take that it's not a good financial investment to invest in women's sports. While somebody might like to put you in a magazine or on a billboard, they're not necessarily going to then open the paycheck to sustain your career. I think what we have to be mindful of is the larger structure that tells women athletes that in order to be legible on the market, in order to get endorsement deals, in order to get coverage, you must fit into this box around appearances. One thing that also comes from that is girls used to wear like huge bows in their hair in softball. And that was all a part of not being seen masculine. It was all a part of not, you didn't want to be the no bow lesbo. I never had the notion that I'm too masculine. I just feel like I'm out here playing in the dirt. I'm not gonna wear a bow. That's just not for me. There's nothing wrong with wanting to look cute and playing great. Like, I love looking fabulous and playing on the field. I'm not gonna wear a bow, but I mean, I'm not going to allow society's views or let them sway what I'm gonna do when I play. Like, I'm gonna add some mascara, I'm make sure my eyebrows look good. And I'm going to go out on the field. I'm not doing it because you want me to be extra feminine. I'm doing it because I like looking fabulous. For me, my passion in growing the sport is the fact that there are so many barriers already placed on women. And if one can just get knocked down, young girls can believe that they can knock down others. My name is Meg Schutzer and I directed Knocking Down the Fences. Strength to me is more than just physical strength. I think we all have in us different kinds of strength. Whatever we have inside of us to overcome the the barriers or the, or the fences, if we're gonna relate it to this film. I am so impressed by AJ. I, I was quickly impressed by her athletic abilities, which are just, I mean, they're pretty mind blowing, but the way that she's a leader for, whether it was her teammates or the girls that she coaches, or now as um, someone who, in the media who does broadcast journalism, she's speaking to people and inspiring them. And she just has so much to say and I, I think that in the end is what um, impresses me the most about her is, is kind of what she has inside that she's trying to share with the world. So much of what we get to see on TV and in movies is directed by men and typically directed by straight white men. And so I think one of the things I've learned as a filmmaker is kind of seeing the difference of what it's like to watch a film that was directed by a woman or by someone who has an identity that's different from what we're normally consuming. And I think um, I felt really aware of that in this film, which is about this amazing black woman. And here I am, this white director. And so AJ and I had some things in common, but I think that there are ways in which like, I just hope that there are more documentaries about AJ. I hope that 
people are inspired to tell her story, there's so much more to it and that we can get kind of an array of perspectives on what AJ is up to. And so that would be kind of one of the things that I would that I would want to share with folks who watch this. Um, and otherwise, I'm just uh, so glad to be a part of this and thank you for watching. And now it's time to catch up with Courtney over in Theater 2, who's going to tell us a little bit more about a short escape provided by Heartland's Indie Shorts Film Festival. I work with Courtney. She's sort of a big deal. So this is our fourth annual Academy Award Qualifying Indie Shorts. We have over 200 films programmed into 32 categories. We have everything from sci-fi to horror to comedy. We have a sports block, an animals block. We've got a little bit of something for everybody. This year you can watch films virtually. You still want to do the staycation and stay at home. We also are doing outdoor style picnic screenings at the Indianapolis Art Center, um, Indie Fringe, and then right here at the Living Room Theaters at Bottleworks. The sci-fi category, as I mentioned earlier, is new this year. It's our first year doing that. And then this year, we've had the most film submissions that we've ever had since we've been doing the program. We had over 3,000 short films submitted this year. We're just really excited to welcome people at all comfort levels. We would love for people to join us all week. If you still want to stay at home, do the staycation experience. After the year we've all had, we just want everyone to come away with us on a short escape enjoy these films, join us outside or inside at living room theaters, but we're just really hoping that people will come out and join us for, for this year's festival. Eric, what's up next? Just hold on. But I want to know what's next right now. Just hold on. The film is called Just Hold On. Oh, I see. Real funny. You know, that gag is so overused. And it would have went better with the softball movie. Everyone's a critic. Here's Just Hold On. This is easy. <laughs> Where are your legs? Where are your legs? Tighten your legs. Hold on. Dig your feet in. Seriously, I have a stuffed animal named Whammy that I sleep with. It kind of feels like a rush of wind. Like when I see the audience, it's just a blur. Well, Mustin Mustin is almost lying. Lying? Hold on super, super tight. My heart was racing. I felt like I was having a panic attack. Try not to get shaken off. It's not complicated. It's gonna be hard to wrap my legs. Like, well, it depends how worried you are. I really want legs. It goes very, very fast. Marley McDonald, a six-year-old out of Houston, riding for the first time tonight. All the way to the wall. She's done it! I think she likes challenges, and uh, she has a temperament that uh, makes her want to do what she wants to do and when she wants to do it, and that's okay. We're proud of her. We're thankful all every day that God spared her, and, and uh, we have faith that uh, she's going to do great things. Marley. Busy girl? Marley. Did you find Mama's paper? Yeah, this is your blood results. This Are you doing this or am I doing Okay. So are you, doing you want me to do it? I don't know. I thought I did and then I couldn't do it. So she was are you, are you I don't know, I can't do this. Right before Marley was born, they gave us a tour of the pediatric cancer center at Texas Children's Hospital, and I remember
being overcome with how real her diagnosis was when I was walk walking through there and seeing all the children that were in treatment. I think that was the moment that the entire experience became very, very real. Somebody asked me after her first ride when she won, <laughs> was I surprised or did I expect her to win? Um, I had no expectation of her winning, but I was not surprised because she's a survivor and a fighter and she... Um, and we used to always tell her to hold on. <laughs> little one first of all because she has red hair you got the prettiest little red hair curls yeah, up I've been, I've been working on my dad and and then like and then i was practicing and then i hold on like that i i did what my parents told me i just hold on really tight until until i cannot get a grip grow up? A spy. I saw that on the list. So what part of being a spy is so interesting to you? Like where you get to fight for the world of the bad guys, where you get to fight them. So I think you can fight for the world because you fought that sheep like a champion. Marley, we just live in the moment. You know, with every passing day, I think we worry about things less. You just have to kind of cherish every day. You kind of got to smell the roses as you walk down the trail. Like that. And she's always full of surprises, but there's always something next. You never really know what it's going to be, but there's always something next. It's time for Mutton Bestie. Fasten those seatbelts, folks. Out of Houston, Marley McDonald. Hi, I'm Merdad. Hi, I'm Rika. Hi, I'm Sam, and we're the filmmakers behind the short documentary, Just Hold On. Well, when we initially kind of got, you know, discovered this whole new world of mutton busting, um, we just thought it was fascinating and so uh, fun and entertaining. We had no idea that it existed. Um, and so we thought to ourselves, like, how cool would it be if there is a little girl who's really passionate about this sport? And so we just started doing some Google searches and and came across um, this viral video of this six-year-old, red-headed, curly-haired little girl who was a Rodeo Houston champion. And um, she was just electric in her, in her interview, her post-race interview. She was so funny, had a bunch of these one-liners, and we thought, Ooh, we gotta go shoot that girl. We gotta go like find out what the story is behind, behind this whole situation. Yeah, we set out to make a movie about a silly rodeo sport for kids, and 
it, you know, it ended up being about much more. So Marley's um, progression with the challenge that she had is, is actually like, as her parents say, it's really miraculous. So the um, odds of what she survived were one in 10 million. Um, or tens of millions, I should say. Basically what happened is at 34 weeks of pregnancy, her mom went in for a typical routine ultrasound and they found a golf ball sized tumor um, in the baby's brain. And uh, they diagnosed it with a stage three uh, glioblastoma, um, which is a very aggressive source, uh, or I should say a very aggressive type of brain cancer. And uh, the doctors basically said, you know, this is a very high risk pregnancy and you know, the odds are stacked against you, um, and of course, you know, Marley's family was, um, you know, very dedicated to having the baby and, um, you know, just following through with the pregnancy, and when Marley was born, basically four days after um, she was born, they took her into surgery, and they did seven hours of surgery um, to remove the tumor, and then she had to go through two years of, you know, post, uh, post-surgery, you know, therapy, cancer therapy. Uh, which is incredible if you think about like a lot of adults don't survive you know that kind of surgery and then you know the the chemotherapy that comes with it let alone literally a newborn so you know they um they always say she's uh, she's our little miracle and there's just nothing this this girl can't do because if she's beaten that what else uh, what else can she do and i think the answer is anything and everything i think part of what we were so inspired about with marley's story specifically was that this mutton busting um seems like such a masculine thing the rodeo itself is so um just so physical and and gritty and this sport is violent especially for little kids um and uh we just love the idea of centering a film about a little, you know, on, on a little little girl in an environment that you wouldn't expect, um, and you know, it's such a perfect uh, setting for her to shine as a symbol of strength. I think uh, strength to me has a lot of different components, and one of them is uh, allowing yourself to be vulnerable. I think a lot of times we live in a so, somewhat of a toxic environment where people are expected to hold things in. Um, and that being strong means, you know, sort of biting the other uh, upper lip and, and holding your emotions in. And I think strength is actually vulnerability. It's allowing yourself to feel and to experience and to be open with whatever you're feeling. And if that's pain and it's sadness, to be open with it. And, and strength to me means knowing that you have the capability within you to make it through whatever hardship or challenge you're facing and to show the grit when times are tough to keep going forward rather than giving up. That, that to me is strength. When you watch the film and you just look at Marley and what she's been through and what her family's been through, sort of they exemplify strength um, in every sense of the word. Um, you know, to me, especially after going through this experience and making this film with this team, you just you you look at Marley and she has this like thirst for life, you know. And um, to me, that's strength is despite what you've you've been through and what the challenges that you've had to face you still kind of keep going you know you still wake up and find the good in the world and um and and you still just keep pushing forward well we hope you've enjoyed these inspiring films that represent strength there's much more to be discovered at the indie shorts international film festival for more information log on to heartlandfilm.org and always remember life doesn't get easier but we do grow stronger and more resilient through the experiences. Well, thanks, Socrates.